Amen. We're very thankful again that God has allowed us to still move, have our very being. We thank God so very much for the ability to have sense enough to say thank you, Lord. We thank God so very much again for those that have taken the time uh, even to come through the inclement weather and try our best to show God without question that we do appreciate the opportunities that he presents to us uh, to worship him in spirit and also in truth. To those again that are with us uh, virtually, we want to know again that we are uh, very thankful. We believe you to be a, a treasured uh, guest of ours, those that may not uh, be in tune to our religious conviction, those certainly that are members of the Lord's Church, we are just delighted that you thought enough to be a part of our of service uh, this day. But if you would, please, I ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Mark. Uh, the chapter is chapter uh, number two. And I want to use for a, a subject, one we've looked at uh, some time back, but I want to share some other thoughts along with this, uh, especially in what's going on in our uh, life right now. It just seems like everybody's got COVID. Everybody is coming down with some situation. Uh, folks are uh, uh, dying again, nothing new. That's the thing, it's nothing new. But I think what's occurring is there are folks that now in our little world uh, that are no longer here that once was here. But again, uh, for the subject of God allow us, I like to use when Jesus uh, is in the house. We're in a, a, a Capernaum uh, in chapter number two. But what has transpired earlier is the fact that Jesus has been doing some, some marvelous, some, some exciting things, demonstrating without question his, his miraculous power. And as a result, uh, what's very interesting is that folk have now gravitated and become more interested in not what Jesus is saying and what he's teaching, but they become more interested in about the miracles, the things that he has been doing. Let's uh, uh, check the book. In the book of Mark, you were uh, chapter one, around verse number 21, I want you to notice what the Bible says that I say, Mark chapter one, around verse number uh, 21, the Bible says this. And they went into a Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What things is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, commandeth he even the unclean spirits. And they do obey him. And then the Bible says, and immediately the same spread, that is his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And so uh, Jesus was becoming famous without question. And it was as the text is teaching because of what they saw. They were astonished by the doctrine, but what captivated their hearts and minds was what they saw in regard to Jesus. And so as we study God's great book, the Bible, he is again in Capernaum, but let's check the book. In Mark chapter one, again, around verse 32, watch what the Bible says, Mark chapter one, around verse number 32, we find these words. And at eve, or when the sun did set, they brought unto him all uh, that were diseased and them that were uh, possessed with devils and all, the city was gathered together at the door and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into what? A solitary place. And there prayed. And Simon and they that were with them followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men are, are, are seeking, they're looking for you, Lord. Watch what Jesus says. 
And he said unto them, let us what? Go into what? The next town that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And so the Bible says he was becoming so popular and famous and they were looking just to be uh, what he could do, not so much what they say. The Bible says Jesus left town. But when we get to chapter two, I want to share with you what the Bible says. When we get to chapter two, he has left Capernaum going preaching, but now he's back. And when Jesus is back, folk know about it, church, because when Jesus is in the house, some amazing things happen. Let's check the book. In Mark chapter two now, around verse number one. Listen to what the Bible says, Mark chapter two, around verse number one. Let's see what the book says. And again, he entered, watch this now, again, he entered where? Into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was where? In the house. And I want to stop right here and say, when Jesus is in your house, or my house, or the church house, some amazing things going to happen in our lives. I want to say it again, when Jesus is in your house, or in my house, Oh, in the church house, some amazing things are going to happen. But let's uh, check the book. Around verse number two, the Bible says, and straightway many were what? Gathered together. And so much that there was a what? Room. That is no room to receive them. No, no not so much as about the door. He's saying even the folk on the outside were so crowded. No room inside, barely room where? on the outside, and especially around the door. There's no way to get into the what? House. But watch what the book says. While Jesus is in the house. Around verse number three, the Bible says, and they came unto him, bringing what? One sick of the palsy, which was born of four. But watch this, verse two said, don't want to leave this one here, that when Jesus is in the house, the word of God ought to be where? In the house. When Jesus especially is in the church house, there ought to be a word from the law. Politics, no. What I think and feel, no. I may use those for examples, but the major thought or teachings ought to be about the what? Word of God. Now, the, the, the text does not tell us what he taught. But when you look at his teachings, let's see what the Bible says. Let's check the book. In the book of Mark, chapter 1. Around verse 14 and 15, let's check the book. In Mark chapter 1 earlier, the Bible shares this about what he may have taught while he was in the house. Let's check the book. In Mark chapter 1, around verse 14 and 15, the Bible had us these words. Now, after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee, watch this now, preaching the what? gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, what's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. So one thing he was teaching during that time is the good news that, you know what? The kingdom of God is coming. Let's check the book. In the book of Mark, since we're there, chapter 9, around verse number 1. Let's check the book in Mark 9. Around verse number 1, he taught about the kingdom, church. Let's check the book. In Mark chapter 9, around verse 1, the Bible had us these words. And he said unto them, that's Jesus. And he said unto them, verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste the death, till they have seen the what? Kingdom of God come with what? Power. And so when the teaching the Lord shared was that the kingdom of God is coming. That's good news. You know why? Let's check the book. In the book of Colossians, the chapter is chapter number one, around verse 13, 14. Let's see what he may have been teaching while he was in the house. Let's check the book. In the book of Colossians, the chapter is one, around verse number uh, 14, 13 and 14. Let's see what the Bible says. Paul writes these words. He says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us where? Into the what? Kingdom of his dear son. Watch this. And whom we have what? Redemption through his blood. Even the what? Forgiveness of his sins. So he says, because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, 
we have a place of what? Safety. We have been delivered where? From the power of darkness and have been what? Translated where? Into the what? Kingdom of his dear son. So he talked about how glorious the kingdom would be. But let's see what else he may have taught. Let's check the book. In Mark 1, again, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Let's see what the Bible says. Around verse number 15, not only did he teach about the, the good news of the kingdom, but the Bible also says, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is where? At hand, it's nearby. He says what? Repent, church, and believe the what? Gospel. So he also taught about what? Repentance. Let's check the book. In the book of Luke, chapter number 13, beginning around verse number one. Let's check the book. In Luke 13, we begin around verse number one. Let's see what the great book says. Around verse number one, church, we find these words. Luke 13, around verse one. Luke says, and there, there were presented at the season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood pilot had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose now, do you think this now? Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? He says, What? I tell you nay. No, that's not the reason. But except what? You repent. You shall all likewise perish. Or those uh, 18 upon whom the tower saloon fell and, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwell in Jerusalem. You think they were that, that bad, that that was the reason that happened to them and nobody else? But he says what? I tell you what? Nay, but except you what? Repent. Ye shall all likewise perish. What's the point? Jesus taught that repentance is necessary. And I don't want you to think just because something bad ain't happening into your life right now that you're all right. The reason why things may not have happened yet is because God is giving us a chance to get our lives right, right now. So he taught in the house, what may he have taught? He may have been talking about the kingdom. That's where we are the saved. He may have been talking about what? Repentance, church, because without repentance, we cannot see God's face where? In peace. But the text also says, he taught about believing in the gospel. Let's check the book very quickly, because I know we got a case, but I, I want to share with you, he was teaching something in the house. That's not, that, that's not often now taught in the house. People are paired that they can live just like they want to, when they want to. But the Bible said that the Lord talked about what? Repentance. But he also talked about believing the gospel. Let's check the book. In the book of Romans chapter 1. Around verse number 16. Listen to what the great book says. Romans chapter 1. Around verse number 16. Listen to what the apostle Paul talks about in regard to the, to the gospel that Jesus referred to. Let's check the book. Romans chapter 1, around verse 16, we find these words. For I'm not ashamed of the what? Gospel of Christ. For it is the what? Power of God and the salvation to everyone that what? Believeth and to the Jew first. Now notice this. The gospel is not for everybody. It's only to those that what? Believe. So if you don't believe, the gospel is not for you. But if you claim you believe, church then you must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let's go further now. The Bible says he's in the house. Let's check the book. In the book of Mark again, around chapter one, a verse number three. Listen to what the Bible says to us there. Mark chapter two, around verse number three. The Bible says this. And they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Four men were carrying him. And when they could not come nigh or close up to the, uh, up to the house because of the press, because of so many people, they uncovered the word, roof, where he was. And when they had broken it up, 
to let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now, before we get to Jesus here and what he does, I, I want to make it very clear that our greatest problem is not financial problem or the supply chain or when it comes to inflation. That's not our, our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is not a weight problem. For, the, for those who enter the year thinking about your weight, that's, that's not your greatest problem. I want to say that to you right now. Uh, loneliness is not your greatest problem. Marriage problem, that, that's not the greatest problem in the world. Job problem, that's not the greatest. Family problem, even identity problem, that's not the greatest. Matter of fact, I want to say it loud and clear, COVID is not the greatest problem in the world. I want to say it again, COVID 19 is not the greatest problem in the world because really when you think about it, thank God he has made it possible for a vaccine to be made. Those who have common sense and use it can what? Avoid perhaps the, 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 the COVID-19. But even if you get it, scientific facts have shown that there's a good chance you'll survive. What I might say, don't allow COVID to stop us from living, church. Because that's not the greatest problem. Matter of fact, sin is not the greatest problem. Somebody say, woo, what you talking about, preacher? I'm going to say it again. Sin is not the greatest problem. What the greatest problem is, is sin that has not been forgiven. I'm going to say it again. Sin itself is not the what? The greatest problem. Because God has provided a means for us to get rid of what? Sin. And so as we look at Jesus now, this is what Jesus deals with first. That's the greatest problem. Sin that has not been forgiven. Let me tell you why. Let's <laughs> I, I, I check the book. In the book of 2 Peter, quickly, chapter 2. I want to share with you why that's the greatest problem. Let's check the book. In the book of 2 Peter, uh, uh, chapter number 2. I want to begin around verse number four. Watch what Peter shares with us. Second Peter, a, a, a chapter two, around verse number four. And again, as Jesus starts, when this uh, uh, a situation presents itself to him, he shares with us that the greatest problem is not our health issues or other issues, but unforgiven sin. Let's check the book. In second Peter chapter number two, I want to begin around verse number four. Listen to what the Bible says. Second Peter chapter two, around verse four. The book says this. For if what? God, watch this now. Spared not the angels. If God didn't put up with the angels, watch the point here. The Bible says, for if God spared not the angels, that what? Sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now watch this. I'm trying to get to verse number nine. Watch this though. He says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example and to those that after to live ungodly and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Then he says, the Lord, what? Knoweth how to what? Deliver the godly out of temptation. And watch this now. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of what? Judgment to be what? The worst thing that this world faces is not against sin by itself, but all sin that has not been what? Forgiven. And so as we look at Jesus now in Mark, this is the first thing that he deals with. Let's check the book. In Mark again, if you would, uh, chapter number two. Let's begin around verse number four to five. 
And let's see what the great book says. We find these words. Around verse 4 now, the Bible says this. And when they I could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the room where he was. And, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus, what? Saw their faith. Saw their faith. These four men failed. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Everybody needs at least four friends that are willing to be dared to do the difficult. They didn't care what it took. Whatever it took, I, I, they didn't worry about, is this a convenient time? Do we need to wait later till folk go? No, they work through even the what? Difficult. They need friends that are willing to do that which is unusual, church. They need friends who are there to be even worrying about, is it going to cost us something? Church, sometimes we just need to what? Do it and allow God to bless our efforts, church. And so the Bible says they go where? Up on the roof. They tear the roof up. And can you imagine while they're digging in the roof, and back then uh, the roof study says were very flat. They may have some beams here, then a big gap here, some more beams here, and then dirt and, and, and clay uh, put in between with leaves and what have you. And so it wasn't really so hard, but they dug that. And can you imagine while, while Jesus is teaching, while he's preaching, all of a sudden the folk now, you know how we go, we, we'll, just, just, just the minor distraction, and they're looking up. And now the man descends down. And when he descends down, the Bible says, that the first thing that Jesus does after uh, recognizing these folks' fear, he says to the paraplegic, the one was paralyzed. And I want to think about this. When you're paralyzed, you can't do for yourself. Get the picture here. This man here probably can't clean himself. He has to be moved around. Can you imagine, perhaps for some people, their disposition right now, there, there's nothing I can do, and, and, and no need to me to be thinking about getting any better. But what the text teaches us, church, that they had enough hope. Wherever Jesus is, there is what? Hope. What is hope? Let me share with you a definition. It's the feeling of trust, security, and a reason to keep going on. Hope says, I can what? Go on. I don't have to stop here. I don't have to accept my condition. Hope says I can anticipate something. It is a feeling, of, again, of expectation, of anticipation, a longing for a certain thing to happen. Now, they, they, they must have heard that Jesus did some, some special stuff, church. Remember what we read in Mark chapter 1, around 38 and so, uh, he became uh, such that the Bible says his fame went where? Everywhere. So they heard about what? They heard about Jesus. Now, when, when, when hope in the house, hope does this. Hope lives on the basis that it ain't about what I can't do, but it's about what God promised he did. Come on, say it again. Hope lives not on what I cannot do, but hope lives on the fact of what God said he would do and what he's promised. Let's check the book. In the book of Romans chapter 4, around verse number 20 and 21. Let's check the book. Again, Romans chapter 4, around verse number 20 and 21. Hope lives not on what it cannot itself do, the person can do, but what on God has promised that he would do. Let's check the book. In Romans chapter 4, around verse number 20 and 21, the Bible says this, talking about Abraham, man in his old age, about 100 years old before he has a child. His wife ain't had no child uh, uh, either. Uh, she's old. But the Bible says he what? He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was what? Strong in faith. 
giving glory to God and being what? Fully persuaded that what he had what? Promised he was able also to what? Perform. You know something? Hope has friends. And he has more than just these four folk here. Let's check the book. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Around verse number 13. I'm going to say faith. Or I should say hope has friends. Let's check the book. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Around verse 13. The Bible says this. And now abide in what? Faith, hope, and what? Charity, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Charity. The Bible says that faith has more friends than just these four men. It also has a friend called faith. And thank God he has a friend called love. You see, these four men must have had faith in what God could do. And they must care enough to love him to do what they did for him. So again, faith has friends. Faith also expects God to answer. I want to say it again. Hope, I should say. Hope also has what? It has the expectation that whatever God has said, he will what? He'll answer. Let's check the book. In Psalms 37, verse 4 and 5, again, hope expects God to answer. And it ain't about will he answer. Hope expects God to answer. Let's check the book in Psalms 37, around verse 4 and verse number 5. Listen to what the Bible says, Psalms 37, around verse 4, verse number 5. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 37, around verse 4, verse number 5, we find these words. Delight thyself also where? In the Lord. And what? He shall give thee the what? The size of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to what? Pass. So if you desire it, God has already said what? He'll do it. And we know it must be according to his will. But faith expects God to answer. Let's check the book. In Mark chapter 11, around verse 24. Mark 11, around verse 24. Listen to what the Bible says. Mark 11. Around verse number 24, watch what the great book says. In Mark 11, around verse 24, the book says this. Jesus says, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you what? Pray, believe that you what? Receive them, and you what? You shall what? Receive them, church. Faith says, I expect God to what? Answer. You know what else faith does? Faith is louder than the crowd. Can you imagine all the noise that was going around when Jesus was in the house? But they didn't allow the crowd and the noise to stop them from where? Getting this man where? To Jesus. And so again, I say, not only is preaching or the word of God ought to be in the house, but also hope is in the house. Wherever Jesus is, there is hope in the house. Well, let's continue to check the book. In Mark again, chapter 2. Around verse number 7, verse number 9, I want, I want to share something with you that's not said in the text, but in study, you can understand why these folk felt this way. Let's check the book for a moment. In Mark chapter 2. Around verse number uh, uh, six now, the Bible says this. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but who? God only. Now, here is their, their mindset. Remember in Job chapter 4, round verse 7, let's go there just quickly, Job 4, round verse 7. Here is the mindset of hope back then. Job chapter 4, around verse number of 7. Let's see what the Bible says. Job chapter 4, around verse 7. Here, here is their mindset. This, this, this was something prevalent uh, during that day and time in their, in their culture. This, this is how they thought. In Job chapter 4, around verse number uh, uh, 7, 
when Joel was going through his stuff and his so-called friends were there and, and they finally talked to him after waiting about seven days before anybody said the word. When they say something, let's listen to some of the things they say. Around verse seven, the Bible says, uh, Eliphaz says this, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished, being innocent, oh, where were the righteous cut off? He said, now come on, Joel. Ain't nobody that I can, 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 can recall ever went through some bad stuff when they were doing the right thing. Now, come on. So, you know what that means? That means you ain't innocent. Verse 8, even as I have seen, they that plow inequity sow what? Wickedness reap the what? Same. He says, what I see, when folk mess up, God deals with them. So, even in Jesus' day and time, this is way back in Job, but even in Jesus' day and time, uh, even his disciples thought a little bit like that. Let's check the book. In the book of John, if you go very quick to John chapter 9, verse number 1, verse number 2. Watch what the Bible says, John chapter 9, around verse 1, verse number 2. Uh, uh, they also thought like that. Watch what the great book says. In John 9, beginning around verse number 1, the book says this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was what? Blind. From his birth. And his disciples now asked him, saying, Master, who did what? Sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. So they even thought if something bad is wrong with somebody, their conclusion is that this person has sin in their life. The rabbis also believe this. They say that, that is the teachings of that day and time, Jewish people. They believe that the only way somebody could get physically healed, watch this because this is interesting as, as we study here. They believe that the only way you could get physically healed is that you were forgiven of your sins. Watch this now. Watch, watch what the text will teach us. They believe the only way you could be healed of your disease, your situation, your health issue is that your sins were forgiven. They also believe that when one was messed up, so-called sick with some kind of disease, that that was showing that God was angry with the person. Now watch, watch what Jesus does. Now. Watch this. In verse number eight, if you would, back to Mark. I'm sorry, very quickly, back to Mark. Watch what the text teaches us here. Back to Mark. In Mark chapter two, around verse number eight again, after these scribes say, come on now, he is just insulting God for him to have the audacity to say to this man, your sins forgiven. Who in the world does he think he is? Only God can forgive sin. Now watch this. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, uh, why reason ye? These things in your heart. Because I know where it's coming from. It comes from your heart. He says this, verse 9. Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. So he says, I, I know how you think. And so, yeah, it, it, it seems easy for me just to say your sins forgiven. Uh, I know what you believe, but you can't prove that I'm wrong, but I know what you believe. So, yeah, it is easy for me just to say it than to have this person to walk. That's harder. So watch what Jesus says. Now, watch, watch how this comes together now. He says in verse number 10, but that you may what? Know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says for the sake of the palsy, I say unto thee what? Arise. Take up thy bed and go thy way unto thy house. Watch this. And when and immediately he arose, watch this now, took up the bed and went forth before them all, and so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, He never saw it on this fashion. Now, watch, watch, watch the book now. Watch this. They believe the only way you can heal somebody 
is your sins are forgiven. Early when the first study this passage a long time ago, I'm saying, yeah, Jesus, uh, anybody can say stuff like that. That's easy. But why this was important that he forgave sin first was to help them even their own mindset. If that's what you believe, that the only way this man can be healed is his sins forgiven, then when I heal him, that means, according to your mindset, that this man's sin was what? Forgiven. Get the point again. They believe you cannot heal somebody unless their sins are gone. So Jesus does what first? He forgives the man. Now he turns around and proves to them that if that's your logic, I'm going to show you that now I'm going to tell him to walk. He's healed. So you know what that means? It means that what? His sins must have been what? And they couldn't say a darn word. What are we saying, church? Jesus is in the house. There's not only hope in the house, but there's help in the house. Let me tell you what I mean by help. Help, by definition, is this. To make it easier for a person to do something. To give one in need something necessary as to be. I want to say it again. When you help somebody, you make their life easier. You, you help the person get something that they what? Need. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Let's check the book. In the book of Matthew, if you were chapter 11, around verse 28, watch what Jesus says on one occasion. Again, when, when Jesus is in the house, not only the word of God is ought to be in your house, or my house, or the church house, but there ought to be some hope in the house. There ought to be some what in the house? Some help in the house. Now watch what Jesus says. In Matthew 11, around verse 28 and 29, the book says, Come unto me, all ye that are what? Labor and are heavy laden. You weigh it down. And I will give you, I'm going to give you some help. Help, help. Watch this. You know why? Take my what? My yoke upon you. And learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. He will give you his yoke. The idea of a yoke was like a wooden apparatus. And what Jesus is saying is, in this case here, it was designed. He, 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 he carved this thing out. He has put us in a position when we, when we yoke to him that our life going to be better than it was without us being what? Yoked up to the Lord. He's going to make it what? Easier. Watch this class. We need sometimes somebody to help. Let's check the book. In Philippians chapter 4, watch this. Philippians chapter 4. When Jesus is in the house, there is also help in the house. Watch this. In Philippians chapter 4, around verse number 6, familiar text, but I, I, want, I want to share with you a, a real situation. And I, and I can talk about this situation. In Philippians chapter 4, around verse number uh, 6 and verse number uh, 7, watch what the book says. We find these words. Paul writes, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, be careful that it's going to be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Here's the reason. And, here's the result, I should say. And the what? Peace of who? God. Which passes all understanding. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here it is, church. When Jesus is in the house, there's help in the house. We, we, we need somebody to, to ease us. Sometimes you, you, you can have something so heavy on your mind. You don't know what to do or what to say anymore. I remember when I first got diagnosed that I had cancer. That, that, that really kind of shook me. And I, and, and I, I believe I have faith. But, 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 but I'm going to be absolutely clear. It bothered me. Not that I was ready to run off any, any bridge and do anything crazy, but, but, but it stuck in my mind. Wife told me it's going to be all right. Doctors too, but you know something? They, they could say anything. <laughs> but, 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 but I needed some help. I took it to Jesus. I took it to God, church. And what I'm saying, he helped me, church. He eased my mind. He gave me some what? Peace. And when Jesus is in your house, that's not only hope in the house, but there's help. 
in the house. What's amazing again, uh, it's, 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 10 years later, about 10 years later, they come back and they took a test day. Oh, we, we think we, we need to come down here and look, look, at, look at something. Same myself, wait a minute, they, 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 they took whatever was out and they, they didn't know more, so what's my problem? They said, well, we see some little traces in your, in your blood and what have you, and so we're going to recommend radiation. So I said, oh, here we go again. But I remembered. <laughs> the same Lord that helped me 10 years ago. As the same Lord that would help me on that particular day. And so I, I had peace of mind. What am I saying, church? When Jesus is in your house, there's also help in your house. When Jesus is in your house, there's healing in your house. And as we see in this particular case, I don't want to don't want to belabor this anymore, but this man was healed. Can you imagine now somebody that could not wash themselves, could not brush their teeth? I don't even know if they had toothbrushes back then. It don't make a difference. Uh, it, it, he could not do for himself. But now he's what? Heal, church. And not only can the Lord heal us physically, he can heal us mentally. He can heal us emotionally. And sure enough, he can heal us from our sins. So when Jesus is in the house, leave this last one with you. There is not only ought to be the word of God in, in that house, not only ought there be hope in the house, not only ought there be help in the house, not only ought there be healing in the house, there ought to be some happiness up in here in this house, church. Let's check the book. And Luke, again, I'm sorry, Luke, Mark, very, very, very quickly. Luke just says the same thing, too, uh, Luke 5. But, but, but back quickly to, to, to Mark chapter uh, uh, 2. Watch what the book says. Mark chapter 2. Let's, let's finish up verse, verse number 12. The Bible says this. And, and, and one, immediately, chapter 2, verse 12, he arose took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they all were what? Amazed. And you know what they did? Glorify God. Saying we never saw it on this day. Church, when Jesus is in the house, not only will you glorify God, but those that soon enough care about you, or, or, or just amazed. They, they know where you were. They know what you went through. They saw you lumping. They saw you couldn't move. They saw you had trouble in your life. But now, they saw what God did. And you know who got the glory? God got the glory. Let me leave this passage with you in the last eight minutes. In Luke 17, yes. Yeah. 16 through 18, let's move there. When Jesus is in the house, again, there's some happiness in the house. There's some glorifying God really in the, in the house. Let me leave this passage with you in the let's move there. In Luke 17, if you will, very, very quickly, uh, you know the story, there are 10 lepers that come down the road uh, they see Jesus, they ask for Jesus to uh, help them get rid of their leprosy. And sure enough, the Lord said, just going down to, to, to the priest. Everything will be all right. Before they get there, they're healed. And the Bible says, only one comes back. He's healed, church. Verse 16 says, when you look at 15 also. And one of them, when, they, when he saw that he was healed, when we see a difference in our life, we ought to say something. And one, I'm sorry, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice. Church, he walked open to want Jesus to hear him. Glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was, whoo, a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, said, were there not ten cleansed? We are the now. Watch this. I think I've said this before, but I want to say it again. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. Watch this. Lesson is yours. There is nothing in the text that's, that's, that gives us any indication that when, when Jesus asked the question, we're the nine, that the man said, well, you know, brother, 
them, 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 folk, you know what I'm they, they just going on about their business. When God does something for you, don't worry about the other folk and criticize other folk, what they ain't doing. That's God in their business. That's all we remember. Let's thank God for what he's doing for us. Those that choose not to, they'll find out that they'll need that same God once again. There might be someone today, not a child of God, that need to have Jesus in your house. Because you know why? You'll have a word of God in your house. You'll also have hope in your house. You'll also have help in your house. You'll also have healing in your house. And also you'll have happiness in your house. This is what you do. In John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus says, unless you believe that I'm he, he who, he who was chosen to come to die for the sins of the world. We must also, as he said, and I'll study to repent. He says, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you're going to perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Matthew 10, 32 and 33 says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. The, the point is, he says in Mark chapter 8, he says, if you are ashamed of me down here, I'll be ashamed of you up there. Don't be ashamed. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he says, you also must be willing to be baptized. Why? Because Mark says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And you've heard me say this time and time again. I remember this very clear. Someone says to me in study, and he says, do you believe that anybody can be saved who does not obey and so just because he said it, that's why we need to do it. But the Bible says baptism is for the forgiveness of sin. Acts 2, verse 3. And so if there's one today that 